Time now for the week that was, when we take a look at the top stories that made headlines around the globe this week. And we'll start with President Bola Tinubu, who on Friday wrote to the Senate about the resolve of ECOWAS to restore democracy in the Nigeria Republic and reinstate ousted President Mohamed Bazoum. He also sought the backing of the upper chamber of the National Assembly on the cutting off of electricity supply to Niger. Tinubu, who doubles as chairman of West African bloc ECOWAS, sent delegations to Niger, Libya and Algeria to resolve the crisis. Despite the flurry of diplomatic activity, the delegation left the capital, Niamey, without meeting the deposed leader. Defense chiefs say all options remain on the table. Military Bureau and deployment of personnel for military intervention to enforce compliance of the military junta, to enforce compliance by the military junta in the year, should they remain recalcitrant. Freezing assets of state enterprises and parasitas in commercial banks. In light of the foregoing, I wish to respectfully solicit the support of the National Assembly in the successful implementation of the ECOWAS resolution, as outlined in the attached communique. Notwithstanding the provision of such section 4 of this session, the President, in consultation with the National Defense Council, may deploy members of the armed forces of the Federation on a limited combat duty outside Nigeria if he is satisfied that the national security is the only Indian threat or danger, provided that the president shall within seven days of actual combat, combat engagement, seek the consent of the Senate, and the Senate shall thereafter give or refuse the said consent within 14 days. Meanwhile, the ECOWAS Committee of Chiefs of Defense Staff has wrapped up this emergency meeting in Abuja with a commitment to prioritize diplomacy as a regional bloc seeks to restore order in the Republic of Niger. The committee has been deliberating on the political crisis and working towards a resolution within the seven-day ultimatum issued by the ECOWAS leadership. Arise Defense correspondent Ferdinand Duroa. With less than 48 hours before the end of the seven-day ultimatum issued by the authority of ECOWAS heads of state and government for the military junta in Niger to revert to the status quo or risk consequences, including a possible military action, the ECOWAS Committee of Chiefs of Defense staff say dialogue and negotiations will be at the forefront of the approach to restore peace. Rising from a three-day emergency meeting, the defense chiefs condemned the actions of the coup plotters and reiterated their commitments to combating threats to democracy on the continent. Throughout our discussions, we have collectively recognized the gravity of the situation and the urgent need for a well-coordinated response. Deliberations have been marked by a spirit of unity, cooperation and determination to address the challenges at hand. We have examined the immediate implication of the coup in the, in the in Niger Republic and its potential ripple effects across the ECOWAS region. We have also deliberated on the broader implication for democracy, peace, and stability in West Africa. I'm pleased to note that our discussions have yielded valuable insights and actionable recommendations. We have acknowledged the need for a comprehensive approach that encompasses political, security, and diplomatic dimensions. It is imperative that we translate our deliberations into concrete actions that effectively address the crisis and prevent a recurrence in the future. ECOWAS will not be used for coups. Democracy is what we stand for and democracy is what we sustain. The ECOWAS Commissioner for Political Affairs and Regional Security emphasized that several measures are being taken by the regional body to negotiate peace in Niger. He says ECOWAS is determined to ensure democratically backed governments are not truncated by unconstitutional means, but will not prioritize military actions. Uh, war or intervention, military, is not our uh, what is it, um, uh, option of choice. It is the last resort. We want diplomacy to work. 
and we want this message clearly transmitted to the leaders of the junta in Niger that we are giving them every opportunity to reverse what they have done and to return the country to constitutional order. That failing, all other measures will be on the table, including the military option. The defense chiefs also pledged to strengthen the regional security architecture to effectively combat threats within the region. Also, there was an official handover as General Christopher Musa began his tenure as the chairman of the ECOWAS Committee of Chiefs of Defense Staff, taking over from the defense chief of Guinea-Bissau. Ferdinand Duroha, Arise News. All right, uh, so Kade Niger is a problem child to West Africa, isn't it, to ECOWAS? And as you will recall, uh, this is a country after the heart of the former president, General Buhari. That was where he said he, <laughs> he probably to. would run, <laughs> run to if he gets to, you know, heated up in Nigeria. Yeah. Um, two days to the expiration of the um, deadline given to uh, the military junta in the Nigeria Republic. The president, our own president, who was the chair uh, of the ECOWAS, you know, heads of state, uh, is now formally asking the Senate to prepare, you know, for approval to prepare uh, for a military action if uh, the junta fails, you know, to heed the call to return power to President Bazoum. A lot of people are worried, uh, worried especially because of the fact that this is a neighboring country. Uh, a lot of people are also worried that why um, the rush and, and why Niger? Uh, because uh, if it is wrong for Niger, uh, shouldn't it have been wrong for the four other West African countries uh, that now firmly you know, have military rulers? Talking about Burkina Faso, talking about Guinea, uh, talking about uh, who else is there, Mali, and of course, to an extent, Chad, which may not be a part of uh, a member of ECOWAS, but of course, you know, it's the president of Chad that ECOWAS is sending as a ministry, you know, to Niger. And people are therefore slightly apprehensive that why war at this point in time? It is disturbing. It's really worrying. But at the same time, we have to look at the facts here and then balance the story. Uh, on the one hand, you look at the fact that the president President Bola Tinubu, he came into office as the president of Nigeria, singing the tune of Pan-Africanism. And then he went on to um, the ECOWAS meeting, and he made it clear that once he became the president of ECOWAS, or chair of ECOWAS, he made it clear that there is no more coup. We don't want any more coup. It will not be tolerated. And I want to believe that this was a statement that he made in agreement with all the other ECOWAS presidents. So it wasn't a unilateral decision. Mm -hmm. It was a general decision by the entire body of ECOWAS and heads of state from ECOWAS. Now, having made that decision, they have to back it up. They have a duty and responsibility to say something and to mean exactly what they said. Now, when you look at the story of Chad, you look at the story of Mali, that of uh, Burkina Faso, Guinea, Guinea, and so on. When you look at their story, they happened before President Tinumbu became the leader of the ECOWAS community. So he cannot retroactively take a decision to say, remove all of them from office and reinstall or reinstate mm. uh, the uh, politicians that were in government before they came in. He can't do that. And if he can't do that, it means that anything that happens under his watch, they have to make sure that they take action and they, do, they make it decisive in such a way that it cannot be mistaken. They will know that ECOWAS will take action. But in the midst of all of this, Nigeria is in a situation where a lot of people are saying that even our president is not firmly in place because, because they still... Uh, a court case hanging like a noose around his neck. Mm -hmm. Not sure that he will be there uh, in a few weeks' time. That's on the one hand. Then on the other hand is the fact that our economy, I am not sure, can carry a war 
if it happens, especially one that might bring in our other neighbors like Mali, like Burkina Faso, like Guinea. And this is a war that probably will involve Russia. So we could end up in a situation where we're proxy for UK, Absolutely. Europe, and America against Russia. Mm. Russia will send in the Wagner Group. They already are in Mali. They're already in Guinea. They are in Burkina Faso. So if you now allow them to send in more troops, uh, more mercenaries into that region, and then we are fighting on this side, and America will support, and most likely UK and Europe will support, then we are in a war that we actually don't have any control over. Mm. And that is a dangerous uh, situation. I will want to say that the president made the right move in inviting some other leaders. Uh, I think I saw Abu Bakr, um, the general Abu Bakr Abdul Salam. I saw some uh, religious leaders from the northern part of Nigeria that were sent as emissaries to go and have a chat with uh, the, uh, the, coup, the, the coupists. Yeah. They went in there and it seemed that, yes, they're there, but whether that will change anything, I'm not sure. But it, it I didn't think it anything. is always... They, are back. they didn't even see Bazo. Yes. They didn't even get yeah. to speak with, the, with Ch you know, Chiani himself. Yes. You know, you know. So the, the bottom line is, I think conversation is better. Jaw jaw, as they say, is better than a war war. Mm. So it is always better to have that conversation and keep that conversation going. Put the military in uh, Niger on the, on the uh, back foot at all times. Mm -hmm. Never make them uh, feel safe or able to settle down and continue life as normal so that they know that they're not welcome, they're not allowed. But going to war with them in a couple of days, mm. that will be a very dangerous precedent that may not uh, augur well for the country or for even the, uh, the region as equus. Especially in the third month, of a new president yes. who is still uh, more or less, you know, trying to form his cabinet, trying to, you yes. know, I just appointed, you know, army chiefs, yes. uh, uh, defense chiefs, and he's still trying to establish his own legitimacy. Yes. And you know what he said in, in, in that popular film, you know, uh, of old, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, uh, shoot if you want to shoot. Don't talk. Don't talk. <laughs> exactly. Let's see how far exactly. the president we can go. We have to see whether he's going to shoot. But um, I think if you ask my advice, if I were to be in the cabinet, I'll be saying, Mr. President, war is not a good idea right now. Mm -hmm. It's not a good idea right now. All right. All right, so we'll proceed. President Bola Tinubu has withdrawn the nomination of Miriam Shetty a minister, as minister replacing her with Mariga Mahmoud Bankure, also from Kano. By this update, the president increased the number of his ministerial nominees to 48, with the inclusion of the name of his campaign spokesperson, Festus Kiamo. All of this came as the Senate screened 13 other nominees on Friday. Senate returned to plenary on Friday to another letter from President Bola Atinumbu, increasing the number of ministerial nominees from 47 to 48 in that letter is the name of the spokesman of Tinubu's presidential campaign, Festus Kiyamu. Senior advocate of Nigeria, Kiyamu was the immediate past Minister of State for Labor and Productivity. Tinubu, however, withdrew the nomination of Miriam Shetty from Kanu State, replacing her with Dr. Maria Mahmoud Bunkuri. Resolve to withdraw the nomination of Dr. Miriam Shetty. Furthermore, I am pleased to nominate Dr. Mariga Mahmoud Bonkuru and, and Mr. Festus Keamo San for consideration and if deemed fit, confirmed by the Senate as ministers. Senate on the same day screened 13 more ministerial nominees, beginning with the immediate past governor of Oshun State, who was asked to take a bow and go after he briefly introduced himself. Former Governor of Yobe State, Ibrahim Gendam, who currently serves as Senator representing Yobe East, was next on the lineup. He too was asked to take a bow and go. Earlier, the Senate leader, Okoyemi Bamdele, explained that the Senate merely exercised its power and privileges each time it extended the privilege of bow and go to serving and former National Assembly members. It is the considered opinion of this Senate 
which is also consistent with global best parliamentary practices and procedure. The members of parliament who had served in parliament are asked to take a bow. Gendam falls in this class and the Senate offered him all the entitlements. Senate extended similar treatment to the ministerial nominee from Niger State, Aliu Sabi, who was in the 8th and 9th Assembly. Standing before you here gives me so much joy, knowing fully well that the 10th Senate has already begun to perform that very great national duty that the Senate has always been known to perform. The ministerial nominee from Baezo State, Heineken Lopobri, a two-term senator and former minister of state for agriculture, also enjoyed the privilege of bow and go. I had the rare privilege of becoming speaker of Baezo State Assembly. I also had the rare privilege of being here for eight years. And thereafter, I also had the privilege of being screened by the Senate and confirmed to be a minister between 2015 and 2019. The Senate spent a considerable period of time grilling the ministerial nominee from Lagos, Dr. Tunji Alausa, worried about the rate Nigerian doctors are leaving the country for greener pastures. Alausa said the solution lies in massive infrastructure development in the health sector. Former Governor of Plateau State Simon Lalong, his colleague from Zamfara State Belo Mutawali, and Atiku Bagudu from Kebi State took few questions and were also asked to take a bow and go. Senate wasted no time with former Senator Al-Kali Hamed Said, asking him to take a bow and go. The same privilege was extended to former member of the House of Representatives, Dr. Yusuf Tanko Sununu, the first man ever to be nominated as minister from the Federal Capital Territory, Sefania Gisalo, himself a former member of the House of Representatives, appeared next. Sefania, who was chairman Abuja Municipal Council for six years, was accompanied into the chamber by the immediate past FCT Senator Philip Aduda. He too was asked to take a bow and go. Next was um, Shaibu Abubakar uh, Audu, uh, son of lead governor of Kogi uh, State, Prince Abubakar Audu, who spent a considerable period of time banking, responding to questions on Nigeria's uh, economy, especially what can be done to save uh, the country's currency, the Naira, from constant free fall. Ministerial nominee from Kanu, Hamed Tijani Kwaso, was also screened. He's an engineer by profession and a grassroots politician believed to have worked strongly for Tinubu's victory at the polls in Kanu. Senate eventually adjourned plenary to Saturday for the screening of the remaining seven ministerial nominees, including Festus Kiamu. Omo Bazwai, Rise News. All right, that's a good one there, uh, but there are two clear issues for me here, Coyote. Um, of course, the issue as it affects uh, Kiamu coming in um, at the last minute was not part of the first batch, was not part of the uh, uh, second batch. It turns out that, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a third batch, which of course made uh, Kiamu to go on Twitter to say that, you know, it's a miracle working God. It must be, you know, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, but uh, more importantly is the manner in which Miriam Shetty, you know, uh, was removed uh, and replaced by another candidate from Kano who happened to be a classmate. They went to school together, went to high school together, went to a university together, both doctors. I understand that uh, it is the prerogative of the president in matters like this, but we're dealing with a president who had sufficient time to form his cabinet, um, had to submit the last, the first batch, just 60 days, just, just on the cross of 60 days. Uh, and then uh, the second batch came in, uh, uh, which had, you know, uh, Miriam Shetty. And then last minute, I, I don't think anybody should have to suffer that kind of humiliation that she has been made through. And I think that she has carried, I said properly to say that, oh, I've just been told, but you know, I accept in good faith. Uh, is it that there was nobody that could have at least informed her before she, Got you know, to gets to, National to the National Assembly? She didn't nominate herself. Somebody nominated her. She went through pre-screening, went through uh, security checks and everything. And we couldn't discover that um, uh, she won't be suitable or that there will be a better person 
who could have misled the president or even the people around the president? What could have happened? We don't know. But that's not tidy. But more importantly is the issue of the fact that um, we now have a bloated, we will have a bloated cabinet. First time ever in the history of our country at 48. 40, at 48. I, I'm not very comfortable with that. And I hope that this is not just about rewarding, you know, politicians. There is a reason why the Constitution of Nigeria recommends one per state. And if you have to add FCT, just like President Molatinubu has done, you know, brilliantly well, picking somebody for the first time from FCT itself, making 37. And we have seen how successive, you know, gov uh, 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 government, presidents especially, have decided to say, okay, we need to bring in a few more people. Let's have one per a geopolitical zone. And you add six more, you know, to the existing 36 or 37. That has been the standard until, of course, under Buhari, when he added one name and had 44. At 48, uh, it's slightly laughable. Even if you are trying to create new ministries, what precisely are we doing? Um, and, and I'm interested in what happens elsewhere in the world. In the US, for example, as you know, Kade, uh, it is 15 secretaries of state. Biden added about 10, you know, uh, updated, you know, upgraded three people um, uh, to cabinet position, in addition, of course, to the, to the position, to, to that of the VP, uh, including the UN permanent secretary, you know, uh, uh, of America. Add 10 to, to 15, that's 25. That's the world's biggest democracy. Those are the people around. One of the largest economies in the world. If like not, if not number one, number if not number one. one. Yes. Uh, let's go to the UK. Yes, a parliamentary system, but then we have only 22 cabinet members who, of course, have to be either, you know, members of the House of the or House of Lords or House of Commons. 22. Our own Kemi Bidnor, of course, as you know, is there. In Canada, it grew to 39 only, just under, you know, uh, 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 Prime Minister Trudeau, Trudeau um, who added five to it, grew to 39, one of the biggest economies in the world. Germany, only 16 federal ministers, only 16 federal ministers, the biggest economy in Europe, as you know. Let's come down to Africa. In South Africa, it was Ramaphosa did something interesting. He said that we're experiencing issues, the same thing that we're experience, experiencing now. And he said that instead of the normal 36, he brought it down to 28. Because all the issues that he addressed then are still there. And I think that in Nigeria today, it's probably even more dire at the time that the Orosoye reporter is saying, March agencies, March parastatas don't expand. That's 28 in South Africa. In Ghana, the constitution stipulates clearly that you cannot have more than 19 ministers, but can be fewer than 10. And then if you go to Egypt, one of the three biggest economies in Africa, 32 full ministers, 32 full ministers. How about India? India, which like China, I mean, where we, you could put Nigeria in India in terms of population and you, you know, yes, you, you would still need like five more <laughs> to fill it. Only 29 federal uh, 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 cabinet ministers. Of course, there are 47 ministers of state who will be like your special advisors, you know, and stuff like that. But federal cab uh, 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 ministers that will determine what's going on in India, only 29. What are we doing with 47? I don't understand it. Are we returning to the old days of ministers without portfolio who are just lounging about, you know, uh, I'm a minister, but then what's your, what's your role? What is the role that we need people to do that 36 really cannot get done. I'm a bit worried about that. And I think that um, it's also a bit untidy when you have Ogun State having three ministers, Lagos having two, Kano two, this and that, Delta two. What about the ones with one? All the South is, you know, uh, states, one each. The recommendation of the constitution is that each state must produce one. And the convention has always been that, yes, use prerogative of the president, pick one by geopolitical zone. I don't think, at what point will it have to stop? Yeah, it, it is extremely disturbing. It's something that I, I honestly cannot understand it. I don't know how the president and the people around him came about the idea that you're going to, at the beginning, they picked about 20 uh, special, special advisors. advisors. 
And I'm sure there's still going to be others. No, he had, he had approval for 20. Yes. But he picked 10. Yes. Out of those 10, 10 yes. three will be going as many stars. Yes. So there's yes. still about 13 more, 13 more to, feel. to feel. So you, you have a situation on your hands where there will be plenty of people as special advisors. There will be plenty of people that will be uh, ministers. ministers. And uh, Festus Kiyama has already said he's not interested in being Minister of State. Of State. state. So it is unconstitutional. <laughs> <laughs> so if there is no Minister of State or junior ministers mm -hmm. like some people would like to refer yep. to them, if there is no such thing, then you're going to have to divide Ministry of Information to Ministry of Information, Ministry of Culture, Ministry of National Orientation, mm. Ministry of Television and Radio, <laughs> and then you have four ministries <laughs> from that one on its own. If you have that situation, then it completely ridicules everything it that we're trying to it do does. in terms of managing the resources of this nation. Mm -hmm. Because every ministry that you create, you're going to have permanent secretaries for each one of them. Absolutely. You're going to have directors for each Absolutely. one of them. You're going to create offices for each one of yeah. them. And then each one of them will have different uh, departments yeah. and agencies yeah. that work directly with them. So that means the whole thing gets spread out in a way that you just cannot begin to fathom how we will finance this. In a mm -hmm. situation where we're saying, Buckle up, tighten, tighten the belt, belt, and find a way to make sure that we manage the little resources that mm. we have. A number of decisions have been taken by this government that make you wonder where we're heading. Day one, our subsidy is gone, said the president. Of the cough. Uh, of the cough. Just off the cough. Not, not on the script. Not on the not, script. Not, not, on, not on your plants. He you know. just said it is gone. And we all, a number of us actually, I will say that I'm one of those that thought, actually, yes, this is well deserved. We should get rid of it because it's taking the kind of money is allowing corruption to exist in a way that is not acceptable. And that was fine. But having done that, we're now beginning to ask the question, where are the policies? Where is the policy direction of this government? What is it you're trying to achieve? Especially in a situation where you acknowledge the fact that we don't have plenty of money and yet you have this situation. So in, in rounding it up, mm -hmm. I think I will say that we have a bloated government yeah. and it is not right. And finally, on the issue of Miriam Shetty, I will want to say that it is extremely unfair on that young lady. Mm -hmm. It is extremely unfair to put her in a situation where she's hearing about it right there. And she's highly qualified. I've read her profile. Absolutely. The kind of person that she is, her achievement yeah. and her tenacity to drive things. Yes, she's single. Yes, she's beautiful. Yes, she's intelligent. <laughs> yes, she knows what she's doing. That should not be a reason for a woman. If, the, if she was a man, people would have been celebrating her. So that is really worrying. But we move on to other stories. So Donald Trump has pleaded not guilty in a Washington court to four charges of conspiring to remain in office despite losing the 2020 presidential election. No television cameras were allowed inside the federal court, which is just one kilometer away from the Capitol building which was stormed by his supporters on January 6, 2021. The former president said very little during the 27-minute court appearance. Speaking only to confirm his name, his age, and to enter his pleas of not guilty. Shortly after leaving the courthouse on his way back to his house in New Jersey, he claimed again that he was the victim of a politically motivated prosecution. Well, thank you very much. This is a very sad day for America. And it was also very sad driving through Washington, D.C. and seeing the filth and the decay and all of the broken buildings and walls and the graffiti. This is not the place that I left. It's a very sad thing to see it. Uh, when you look at what's happening, this is a persecution of a political opponent. This was never supposed to happen in America. This is the persecution of the person that's leading by very, very substantial numbers in the Republican primary and leading Biden by a lot. So if you can't beat him, you persecute him or you prosecute him. We can't let this happen in America. Thank you very you much. Everyone. 
Well, this is one story that just doesn't want to go away. It's one that is, it just refuses to go away. This is a man that has done so many horrible, horrible things in America that you begin to wonder, at what point will the Republican Party wake up and realize that this is so wrong? And they're not only condoning it, they're goading him on and they're encouraging him. I don't know what your thoughts are about Trump and this particular uh, indictment. Mm. Well, I mean, my point is that um, no matter, I mean, love him or, or loathe him, uh, Donald Trump has become a factor in American politics. Uh, the sort of things that we used to worry about in other crimes is happening right, you know, under our noses in America, you know. Um, so my point is, let the law take its course. Uh, if he has broken the law, uh, for what happened uh, three years ago, and it can be proven, of course, let the law deal with it. If he escapes it, I think that Trump will be a factor in next year's election. Uh, what I wouldn't want is that, yes, there might have been infractions and horrible things like you, like you said, but then if the court of law says that he's not guilty, I do not think that whole duels should be created uh, in, in front of him just to discourage him from running. Uh, 70 million votes in 2019 um, is no joke. And therefore, uh, he will be a factor. And if he runs again, Biden next year, if he's the candidate of the Republicans, we never can tell what will happen. But then let the law take his course. If he's guilty, let the law deal with him. I don't know what Americans are thinking. I, fortunately, I'm not an American. You're the proponent uh, of democracy. <laughs> I'm not an American, but I don't know how you can claim to be the world leader in yeah. democratic rule mm -hmm. and governance, mm -hmm. and yet the person that a massive number of Americans want to vote for yeah. is someone who tramples all over democracy. Who does a number of things that you just begin to wonder? What does democracy he, he mean? He probably would have avoided the, the Russian-Ukrainian war, by the way. He would have. <laughs> he would have handed it over to them. Yeah.